Well, good afternoon, and welcome to this, my sixth and final presentation on writing historical fiction. It's the genre that attempts to confuse the reader into believing that fiction is real and dismissing the history as bunk. It should work well these days. Today's vehicle will be my new book, The Legend of Seabird, Kimichi, yet to be released through Headline Books. Kimichi concludes the trilogy of the Seabird Westerns that began with The Last Long Drive, which was itself followed by Devil's Backbone, a book that I spoke about just uh, yesterday. Kimichi is a tale of the new Old West. Set in the early 1900s, it is the story of automobiles and telephones, nearly as much as it is of horses, rodeos, and six-shooters. The Old West is fading away, but the modern West has barely taken root. Kimichi involves characters from both worlds, the Old West and the New. There is, of course, Seabird and his beloved wife, Sally, from the two previous novels. But added to this is a new cast of characters trying on for size the new century, a cast including the youngest president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, some soon to be famous environmentalists and women's rights activists. Sounds like Maybe we skipped a century. The idea at the heart of the novel, the meeting of Seabird and Teddy Roosevelt, first occurred to me as a possibility as I was reading a new biography of Teddy and came across a picture of him addressing a crowd in Cheyenne, Wyoming in 1903 at what was called a cowboy stampede is now called Frontier Days. I also knew that at the same time, Seabird was out west rodeoing. Now, I don't know if they ever met, but the idea of Teddy Roosevelt being at a rodeo in Cheyenne, Wyoming, at the same time Seabird was out doing rodeos, was absolutely intriguing to me as an author. What would it be like, I wondered, if this dynamic man and seabird could end up on some adventure together? How would they get along? Or would they? I outlined what I knew of their personalities and backgrounds, then set to work. On the surface of it, the two men could scarcely have been more different. T.R came from landed and wealthy people back east in New York State. He was educated by only the finest private tutors, and his house was full of books on any subject of interest to the young man, books that satisfied his hunger for knowledge or stimulated his curiosity. Well educated, he graduated from Ivy League, Harvard, where he mixed with young people much like himself, only from the best circles. He was proud of that. In his lifetime, he ended up writing 40-some books, many of them on ornithology, which he said he probably would have gone into had he not become president. This is an amazing mind working in different directions. Rapidly, he ascended the political ladder. After a number of small jobs, he became governor of New York and then president by the age of 42. By contrast, Seabird might have hailed from an entirely different planet. His people, the Choctaw, had been dispossessed of their land, driven out from all lands east of the Mississippi as a result of the 1838 Indian Removal Act. His formal education ended after sixth grade in an Oklahoma mission school. The book he read 
when he read was the Bible. And his associations were mainly made with other men like himself, wandering cowboys and ranch hands, working hard, long hours for low wages. And on a personal level, they were also different. TR, with his iron will, had built himself into a burly man of great endurance. Seabird was always slender and slightly smaller than average, but his endurance was unquestioned. He was a natural in the saddle and would spend days at a time astride his favorite sorrel, Kimichi. He loved horses. By contrast, TR had worked hard to become a stiff but competent writer. Seabird spent months at a time, year after year, riding the West he loved and competing so successfully in rodeos. TR also loved the West. But it came at a terrible price for TR. When his first wife, Alice, died suddenly, soon after giving birth to his first child, he was so distraught, he gave the baby to relatives to raise and care for, and he fled to North Dakota, where he bought a ranch he named Alcorn, a place where he found solace in nature and vigorous hard work, and he would always return to that. He himself admitted later in life that he had to keep busy or else blackness would descend. He returned to Elkhorn often as the years went by. After a couple of years of living out there and becoming a rancher, he finally sold the place, sold the last of it off in 1904, and he never returned. That was it. It had served its purpose in his life. Nevertheless, from whichever direction their life experiences had brought them, both men were in agreement on core values and principles. Both men loved the West, not in some mystical, mythical, make-believe fashion, but as a dynamic place populated by real people a place to be respected and protected as you would with anything you truly loved. Both men were destined to leave the West they loved because of other calls. TR, because family and politics called him East. And Seabird, because of his family pressures as well. But neither man lost his love of the West. Seabird was more at ease on a horse or wrapped in a bedroll beneath the canopy of the Milky Way than he could ever be back in Warm Holler, West Virginia. TR was deeply disturbed by the rapacious greed that he saw was daily destroying the most precious of all our resources, its land and water. I suggest you, if you're interested, to pick up something that he wrote, not something about him, and read his writing on the subject of nature, and you will see a tender side of the man that is very seldom explored. Both knew what it was like to lose a love. T.R. with the death of his first wife, sudden and unexpected. And Seabird, when he lost his first love, to his best friend. So when they rediscovered love, both men were hungry and sure to make it last a lifetime. And both loved adventure. T.R. traveled extensively, exploring the world. And when Seabird felt the West Virginia hills closing in on him, he would go rodeoing, as he called it across the vast western plains, sometimes for months at a time. And the more I thought about it, the more the idea of these two meeting appealed to me. 
I knew that should it happen, the convergence of this highbrow East Coast bleeding heart liberal and a conservative laboring man marginalized on the fringe of society, that it would not all be smooth sailing, that the situation could in fact become volatile. The differences, as I have outlined them, were stark. TR was outgoing and perfectly capable of holding a conversation by himself for hours. Seabird was retiring and taciturn by nature and spoke mainly when he had something to say. Now, how is that going to work? In the end, I couldn't resist and had them meet in the very center of the novel and there decided to let the two of them hash their relationship out. But as I wrote, I kept worrying. What if their weaknesses left them in peril? For example, if it came to gunfighting, what would result? Neither man was particularly handy with a pistol. TR's nearsightedness always left him at a disadvantage. And Seabird would joke that no matter how hard he worked at it, handling a six-shooter just felt unnatural. He much preferred his trusty Winchester, with which, by the way, he was a dead shot. In spite of such misgivings, the more I got to know the men, the more I saw that it was inevitable that they would meet and become friends. That in the end, there would come more a meeting of the minds than a clash of personalities. So, I did what I had to do, I just turned them loose together. And I like the results. I hope you will also. I also wanted in this book to explore how the growth of all the new technology and business organizations that emerged just before the birth of the 20th century, especially the huge corporations and their offshoots, the holding companies, called trusts was affecting the nation. These trusts were organizations that broke the bond that had existed between employer and employee and turned the working man into a slave to the factory, just another cog in the machine, while at the same time producing the greatest income disparity ever seen. To give you an example of that, I was not exaggerating. At one time in the late 1800s, the United States government was in financial peril. Where did it go to get help? Some international consortium? No, went to one man, J.P. Morgan, and this one man was able to bail the government out. That's real wealth. Western ranchers owned by spectacled men in Scottish banks who cared not a whit for the land, never conceived of overgrazing as a problem, and hence they set the stage for disaster on the Great Plains. And when it came in the form of a series of brutal winters, that wiped out herds of cattle in the millions. Men who lived on the land at the time, ranchers like the young Teddy Roosevelt, warned them all, but to no avail. But now that he was president, he intended to do something about it. That was one thing about Teddy Roosevelt. If he saw what he perceived as an injustice, he would go tackle it. He wouldn't set up a study committee. The West was a region in flux. Nationwide, women could not vote. Yet in Wyoming, women had exercised that right from the very start. When Wyoming was a territory, women could vote. 
when it was first organized. And when in 1870, some 50 years before there was a constitutional amendment allowing women to, the right to vote, Wyoming applied for statehood. It was told it would have to take the right to vote away from women. The governor furiously responded. This is a direct quote. We will remain out of the union 100 years rather than come in without women, unquote. The government buckled and the territory was quietly admitted the next year as a state. And from the start, women in Wyoming and shortly thereafter, several other Western states could vote. Western women had worked right beside their men. They had herded the cattle, branded the calves. They had attended school with them, saw them face to face in classrooms, knew they were as smart or smarter than most of those boys. And in no way did they feel inferior to them. They even competed in rodeos something that would have scandalized the daintier folks back east. You'll meet some in this book. It was an invigorating place. When Teddy Roosevelt arrived in 1903 on his final tour of the West, a tour that's in the end going to take him to California, to Yosemite, to meet the environmentalist John Muir, he, you will see things that seldom appear in novels. And when he got off that train out west in North Dakota, his first words were, took a deep breath and said, I can breathe again. And he was not speaking of the asthma he suffered from all his life. Now, would he have liked Seabird really? I imagine they would have got on famously. Teddy was far ahead of his time on the race issue. He sympathized with and had a number of Native American friends. It was here in the West that he first tried out the term, the square deal, for which he later became famous. And he used it in a racial context. This is a quote. I fought beside colored troops at Santiago. And I hold that if a man is good enough to be put up and shot at, then he is good enough for me to do what I can to get him a square deal. Still, the residue of the Old West remained. In 1901, just three years prior to the setting of this novel, The Wild Bunch, blew up a freight train and got away with $40,000. But Butch and Sundance were already on their way to Argentina. Bad mill men still roamed the Badlands. And TR had dealt with some of them on his own. So, as you can see, it was a turbulent time, one of immense change. The certitudes of the past were wobbling, but the future had yet to be defined. And that is the setting, and those are some of the players in this last volume of the Seabird Trilogy. Now, I would like to show you some pictures of the players and the places and the tools that made the early 1900s such a marvelous setting for this story. So if you give me a moment, I'll call these up. Chat. Hang on a second. We're figuring this. The green one. Okay. Okay, almost there, all right, 
One more. There. Okay. Come on. There we are. The Legend of Seabird Kimichi. First picture here is just of the cover. Kimichi, you may wonder, is an odd name. When I first mentioned it to my wife, she said it sounds Japanese, but it's an Indian name. Well, it has two different meanings. The first is that brown sorrel there, that chestnut that that cowboy's riding. Seabird's first horse was named Kimichi. This was him. If you've been with me on any of these prior presentations, you've seen this picture uh, nearly every time. Young man here, at the time of this story, he would have been about this, he would look just about like this. He would have been in his prime, probably in his late 30s, as a matter of fact. He made all his own grip, all his own gear, the leather gauntlets on his wrist, those beautiful chaps he's wearing, that useless pistol that he's wearing as a decoration on his hip. Didn't make that, but the rope, he's carrying that lasso with this loop right there. He braided that himself. You can't see his boots. He made those. His saddle, likewise, and his war grip, his bag that he carried things in. He was proud of his abilities. He had ability to work with his hands. It was marvelous. This is a picture of Sally, his wife, as an elderly lady, as I remember her. I did not know her name. She was Granny. And if you want to think of a character that she would remind you of, think of Irene Dunn in the Beverly Hillbillies. Paisley dresses, button shoes, hair in a bun, silvery twinkle in her eye, and she could suddenly turn those eyes flinty when she wasn't happy. She was, she must have been a marvelous young gal. Never very big, maybe five feet tall, five one, maybe 98, 100 pounds, something like this, a small lady. This was a 1986, or 19, 1886 model Winchester that uh, the type that Seabird would have carried with him all the time, traveled with, hunted with, and it was a beautiful 45 caliber weapon. Uh, we've got the, the Winchester right there at the top, lever action, and down below you can see a little bit more of the finer detail of it. The second Kimichi is a river. It's a river that flows down in southeastern Oklahoma, starts up in the Wichita Mountains, flows down to the Red River, which then flows into the Mississippi, which then flows to the Gulf of Mexico. This was the area that the Choctaw people were moved into following that Indian Removal Act by Andy Jackson back in 1838. And this is the area in which Seabird spent his childhood, learned to swim, got water from, fished, hunted along its banks, the Kiamichi River. It really is a lovely area. Perfect for a young boy to grow up in. This is a better picture of it, a picture of the river itself. You can see it's surrounded by hills. It must have echoed when he went to West Virginia. Um, moved there. There must have been some kinship feeling between the mountains of West Virginia and the Wichita Mountains along the Kiamichi River watershed, which is where this picture is taken. The internet's full of beautiful pictures of this river. It's wild in the upper reaches. Uh, a lot of canoeing, um, rapids, things like that, and then it smooths out and levels out uh, farther down its course. And, ends up in a, a braided river. Okay, now to one of the characters. This is a picture, <laughs> you don't even have to introduce this boy. He knows who he is. 
This is Teddy Roosevelt at about that time, maybe a little later than that, standing on the back of his railroad coach, giving a stump speech. He would do that over and over. The train would be scheduled. This would be his own private presidential train called the Elysian. And his private car here was built by Mr. Pullman for him. It was a monster, 70 feet long, with everything you could imagine inside. Mahogany walls, stained glass windows, etc. And every time the train would pull in to any little whistle stop place, he would pound out the back door, stand on the platform, and give us his standard little five, 10 minute stump speech. And then the train would whistle and off it'd go again to somewhere. This was probably a couple years older than uh, the time that he said in the book. By the way, that car, that car that uh, was his special car, he called Isabella, is now a diner in Northern Illinois in a, in a town called Sandwich near Chicago. You can go in there and sit in seats in the same car that Teddy Roosevelt toured the nation a number of times, spent weeks in. It's on my bucket list. This is his first wife, Alice, Teddy Roosevelt's. He fell in love with her in college, madly in love at first sight. He pursued her relentlessly with his will. You know, when he asked her to marry her and she says no, he's not going to take no for an answer. If anything, then it becomes even more important to him. So he pursued her, asked her, asked her, asked her again. Finally, I think she just got worn out and agreed to marry him, but it was love. And then on the 26 years old, when he was 26 years old, and she was a couple years younger, she died right after giving birth to their first baby, a daughter named after her, Alice. Here's the thing. He never, uh, he gave, I mentioned before that he gave Alice to the care of relatives and he fled, that there's no other word for it, to North Dakota to try to recover, to try to pull himself out of his depression. He could not even say the name of his baby girl for years. He referred to as the girl. Later, of course, when he remarried, married a, a woman named Edith, whom he had known since childhood. Edith convinced him. They took Alice, and he raised her, and they got along wonderfully for the rest of his life. Out west, where he fled to North Dakota, along the Little Missouri River, which you see here, he built himself a ranch. You can see up on the front end of this building, horns, and he named it appropriately Elkhorn. For a man from the fancy dancy east, this is a very simple ranch house. But he would write about sitting on the front porch in rocking chair, with rocking chairs and the men at the end of a day sitting there rocking, looking out over the river at the buttes in the area. That it was beautiful. Just want to give you a little direction in case you like to plan to ever get out that way. You can see Interstate 94 going west from Bismarck, headed to you cross 85, going north south, and you come to a little town west of that junction called Medora. Now I don't even know if Medora still exists anymore, but if you go up that little Missouri River along that little road that winds along the way, it'll come to the Elkhorn Ranch. That's where his ranch was. And just to the west of that, including that whole area, is the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Much of the center of this book is situated in that area. Now, what did it look like? There it is. They call it the Badlands. 
it sure does look uninviting. And yet there were water courses, green areas, buttes with pastures on them. There were places there that could be ranched. And on one of those areas, that's where he planted his ranch. Rather forbidding. There he is. This is a this picture is actually taken at Cheyenne, Wyoming, at the Frontier Days, the year that I have set in the book that Teddy Roosevelt met Seabird. He was uh, Teddy Roosevelt was the um, honorary judge of the rodeo, so they built a stand for him, all draped in bunting, and he had his, he had two guards, two Secret Service men guarding him. One of them is standing behind him. Another was downstairs at the base inside the door guarding him because they were always afraid somebody was going to pop him, which someone did in Milwaukee when he was there campaigning. These guys in the front with what looked like Boy Scout hats were members of a group that he had raised volunteers to fight in the Spanish-American War. They were the Rough Riders. And at this event, they surprised him several dozen, possibly a hundred of them, rode in to greet him. It made quite a show. And this is another tool of the time. This is a 1901-02 Ford Model A. A very simple machine. And in the novel, it plays a part. But everything was changing. On one hand, there were men riding around on horseback. On the same road, going down the road, would come this chugging little thing with a bell attached to the steering column and a little horn, little lights, and it could possibly do all of 20 miles an hour, full speed. But this has an important function also in the novel. And that brings us to the end of the slides. Okay, let's get back. Finally, what I'd like to do is read a couple pages from the book Kiyomichi. And this pertains to something that happened when I was a child. When I was a little boy, Seabird, even as an elderly man, would entertain us in the evening sometimes by picking up his lasso and doing rope tricks. Long after he was a, his rodeo riding, bull riding, bronc riding days were done, he would do this. He would go to the rodeos, the county fairs, and he was a headliner in all of his gear that he handmade doing rope tricks. So this is a scene from the book where he ends up doing that. Let me read it later. There's a, a longer scene, but I'm cutting to this part. Back at the rodeo, locating the announcer of the events proved to be no difficulty. A big red-faced balding man wearing a calico shirt and wielding a megaphone took the script Seabird used and briefly scanned it. You really going to do all this, partner? If I don't mess it up, I will, Seabird re replied semi-seriously. We'll see. Well, we'll work you in right after the bronc busting, cowboy. Good luck. And Seabird made his way down to the arena. A lady bronc rider was just picking herself up from the dirt to a nice round of applause and limped her way out through the gate past Seabird as he stepped in. The announcer was in full throat. And now, ladies and gents, prepare yourself, he called. Red Carpenter, the West Virginia whiz, is about to delight you with some fancy roping never before seen west of the Mississippi. Let's hear it for Red Carpenter. A polite smattering of applause greeted him as Seabird walked out to the center of the arena. A small man scarcely five and a half feet tall, and tipping the scales at a solid 140 pounds. He was the third and final twirling contestant of the day. 
he had not caught the shows of the other two. His concern was only with himself and his own performance. It was important to give these people a show they would not soon forget. Something they would talk about at their supper tables tonight and in the saloons and churches where they gathered. While he waited for the announcer to call his first stunt, he shook out the noose in his lasso and warmed up a bit. The rope felt stiff at first. He realized with all these people watching, he was a bit self-conscious and needed to relax. And he needed them to relax as well. He started with a flat spin, twirling the rope in front of his feet, then passing it under one leg to the other hand behind his back, where the right hand picked it up again. Grace and timing. That's it, he thought and smiled. He had done this a thousand times back in Warm Holler. Finally, he was starting to feel energy flowing up through the dirt beneath his feet, up his legs, powering his arms, extending through the fibers of the lasso, giving it a life of its own. The loop followed the motions his arm was making in the air. It shifted directions from flat to vertical. Seabird hopped through the loop several times before it played itself into a new shape, the Texas Tornado. He worked the rope this the way a master musician would his instrument, finishing up his figures by creating a double loop that settled over his body and dropped to the dirt. The folks in the stands and around the fence were now paying attention. The enthusiastic applause proved it. A few whistled. Seabird raised his hat to the crowd and nodded in the direction of the announcer, who called out. For his first stunt, the West Virginia Wiz will lasso a horse running full speed. The gate banged open as a horse and rider charged toward the small man. Seabird, now having reformed the loop perpendicular to the ground, skipped through it, seemingly oblivious to the onrushing horse and rider. And then, with a flick of his wrist and extension of his arm, the loop enlarged even more, drifted out and settled around the steed's neck. Dancing a step to the side, Seabird tightened the noose as the rider drew his horse to a stop. The crowd responded with appreciative applause. And as the rider turned his horse back to the gate, the voice in the megaphone called, Next, Red Carpenter will demonstrate his command of the lasso by throwing a figure eight capturing both the head and the legs of the oncoming horse. At this, the rider pivoted his horse and charged once again toward the man with the spinning rope. And once again, with amazing grace, that man fed out a large loop, made a figure eight in the air with his rope arm, double looping the lasso, and exactly as the horse and rider reached him, the horse stepped through the lower loop while the upper loop dropped over its head. He had the crowd's complete and rapt attention now. It quieted in anticipation as the rider reset his horse before the gate. Seabird picked up a second rope. Watch as Red will now use two lassos, one in each hand, roping the cowboy with one and his cayuse with the other. This was one of the most difficult stunts, requiring the rope artist to be equally dexterous with both hands, sending out two ropes at the same time. Seabird occasionally missed this in practice. Now a bead of sweat formed on his upper lip as he concentrated. Rolling out two loops, Seabird found a moment where they seemed to be slightly out of sync, a warning of danger. But as the rider guided his horse at a gallop once more toward him, Seabird breathed deeply and smiled. It's not me, it's the rope, he thought, launching both at once, capturing the rider and horse with moves as graceful 
as a professional dancer. As Seabird retrieved the lasso from the horse to a rolling thunder of applause, the rider reached down, handing the second rope to the whiz. As he released it, he said with a smile, Mister, I never seen the likes of that before, and I used to work with Buffalo Bill. My hat's off to you. Tipping his John B. to Seabird, he then turned and trotted his horse from the arena. At the same time, the gate opened, and a young man entered bearing a long coiled rope and leading Kiyomichi. That was the next signal to the announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, did you see that? Well, hold on to your parasols and hitch up your britches. The fellow was really into it. Cause the whiz is going to finish up with one of the most difficult rope trips tricks imaginable. He's going to twirl from horseback a 90-foot loop. Attendant, please present the rope. The fellow presented it to Seabird, who took one end and said, please take the rope up the aisle and pointed. At this, the young man climbed from the arena up the aisle through the crowd to the back of the stands, unwinding it completely. The announcer sang out, ladies and gentlemen, as you see, this rope is indeed 90 feet in length. Seabird recoiled it and mounted Kimichi. Man and horse moved to the center of the arena, where he began by shaking out a small vertical loop. Then he enlarged it a bit and slowly lifted it over his head. Continually feeding out rope, the circle grew larger and larger. The new hemp glistened beautifully in the sun. Seabird nudged the horse forward toward the crowd. The loop expanded, drifting over the heads of those in the front row. From the crowd, someone who couldn't stand the tension released a raucous whistle. Unfazed, Seabird edged forward until Kiyomichi's muzzle was nearly touching the fence. The rope was now fully extended in a near 90-foot loop, humming just over the heads of the entranced audience. Magic was in the air. Then slowly, steadily, Kiyomichi began backing away until Seabird was once again in the center of the arena, in the center of the lasso's circle. At that point, he released his end of the rope and dropped it in the dirt. Kiyomichi dropped and knelt on one knee while his rider waved his hat to the standing, stomping, and whistling crowd. Let's hear it one more time for Red Carpenter, the West Virginia whiz, the announcer called as Seabird, with a cowboy whoop, exited through the arena gate on a prancing Kiyomichi.